What's going on everybody? UCF Jaguar back here with GenJag.com and yesterday the Jaguars wound up traveling to the to Minnesota to beat the Minnesota Vikings 14 to 10 if that really matters to you. Now there are a lot of takeaways to take from this game so let's go ahead and get into it right now. There they go, packing stadiums, the shady spitzes flow, nuts they go, macadamia they go, so ballistic. Whoa. This game was really the tale of two tremendous defenses making the opposing team's number one offense look really, really bad. Uh, if you look at what the Jaguars for forced Kirk Cousins to do, Kirk Cousins only went 3 for 8 passing with a whopping total of 12 yards. So, you know, they were forcing uh, Kirk Cousins to throw all kinds of really bad balls. I mean, uh, he was he actually wound up skipping like one of his passes and you know not a good showing by Kirk Cousins You know our defense really forced him, him to uh, do like a lot of bad things But probably the MVP of the defense was Yannick Ngakwe He went in there and had like a sack that was eventually negated by a whole Hingle McCreagleberry three pump rule which uh, led to them getting an automatic first down, but um, besides that, I mean, he had he helped force a fumble. He had a couple like tackles for losses. He was kind of all over the field, and that was really good to see out of Yannick Ngakwe. Uh, I also thought cornerback Tyler Patman flashed a lot. He had an almost interception off of Kirk Cousins, and you know every time this guy's on the field, he flashes a lot. I also thought he, DJ Hayden played pretty well. It'll be interesting to see how that kind of competition goes on for the nickel cornerback spot. But you know I liked what I saw out of both of those cornerbacks and DJ Hayden and Tyler Patman. Now Ronnie Harris in this game actually got the start over to Sean Gibbs in this game. I think I don't know if Deshaun Gibbs was injured or what happened with him, but Ronnie Harrison came over there, man. He was all over the field. I mean, he actually led the team in tackles. He forced a Latavius Murray fumble, which unfortunately didn't get to recover, but you know, he still went out there and made a play and uh, this has to be a guy that Jaguars coaching staff really likes and it'll be fascinating to kind of see uh, how the Jaguars do wind up using him in the regular season. So I thought the secondary played good. I thought the defensive line played very, very well. But, you know, one thing that I did have a problem with is the Jaguars linebackers. You know, I didn't think Miles Jack or Talon Smith had great games. And I also didn't think that Det was very good either with backups like Donald Payne and Blair Brown. I mean, if we start off with Miles Jack, uh, Miles Jack and Talon Smith, man, they were taking pretty bad angles on a lot of like tackles. Uh, I didn't think Miles Gat was very gap disciplined. Of course, he's transitioning into a new a new position, playing middle linebacker in base 4-3 defense. So uh, I didn't think he was very gap disciplined as there were a few runs that went right up the middle that were kind of right through the gap that he was supposed to cover. And also, I thought Telvin Smith uh, didn't do a very good job when it comes to containment. I thought he forced a couple of runs to go outside when uh, he should have probably had outside containment and force the running back to go inside where he has a lot more help than essentially having to go one-on-one -on -one with the running back on the outside. Now when you go to the other side of the ball, we have to talk about the offense and Blake Bortles did not have a very good game this game. I mean, he started off uh, throwing an almost interception, although after I kind of did rewatch the play, uh, it looked a lot worse in live action than it did when you watched replay because D.D. Westbrook did slip on the route that he ran, essentially causing it to basically go in, all, like right into the hands of the defensive back. Uh, but it would have been interesting to see if D.D. Westbrook did stay up, what could have happened that play if he would have caught it or whatnot. But the, set, the, the first actual interception was really, really bad. I mean, uh, if you looked at it, D.D. Westbrook was wide open at the beginning of the play. And then Bortles was staring him down. And then right when D.D. Westbrook made his break, Harrison Smith was reading the eyes of Blake Bortles the whole time. And he was able to easily step in front of that for an interception. So not a very good play by our boy Blake Bortles with forced the interception. But I thought he did pretty well later on in the game. Uh, he, was for, he was having a good amount of completions. He went 12 for 20 that game, having a 60% completion percentage and one thing I liked about this game was the Jaguars coaching staff decided to kind of open the top off the defense and throw the ball deep a lot. I liked how they were testing their guys deep. They didn't really connect on many of them. Niles Paul had a couple of drops. Marquise Lee had um, a, pretty, a pretty bad drop and uh, but I do like how they were kind of throwing the ball deep and 
I thought as the game went on, Blake Bortles did play a lot better. He was having good control over the offense. And, um, you know, of course, NFL Network, like James Jones, before the game, he's all sitting here talking about how much Blake Bortles sucks. And the very first thing he says at halftime is just ripping Blake Bortles for what he did and not even looking at Kirk Cousins, this three for eight, 12 yard game. But, you know, he's going to continue to be um, kind of the punching bag of the NFL until. He actually maybe wins like a Super Bowl. Now, I think one thing our offense did really well is screen plays. I mean, we were extremely efficient and extremely good on the screen plays that we did run. Um, mostly those were two running backs. And uh, the running back situation, Leonard Fournette didn't do too, too well just because he was going against loaded boxes the whole game. Um, he wound up having eight carries for 12 yards and a touchdown. Um, TJ Yeldon had a really good game. He was 10 for he had 10 carries for 39 yards, but he helped a lot in the receiving game, uh, getting five catches for 73 yards. You know, TJ Yeldon played tremendous, I thought, and I really like what I've seen out of TJ Yeldon so far. I remember seeing him during the pre or like during the fun practice I went to, and he looks to be in tremendous shape. And uh, throughout these like last couple of games, he's showed a lot of versatility and. Uh, TJ Yellen obviously is coming into a contract year, so you know he's hoping to have a great year and get paid somewhere. But one interesting thing is Corey Grant really did not get really much looks at all. You know, last game he was all he was on the field a lot, but this game he only had one carry and he only had one catch, as they kind of gave the spotlight to running back Brandon Wilds. Brandon Wilds has been getting all the carries over Tim Cook. It's looking like Tim Cook is on the outside looking in as Brandon Wilds carried the ball for he had eight carries for 32 yards so you know he's getting pretty decent volume and uh, I mean if we're going to keep it fourth running back it's most likely going to be Brandon Wilds unless they decide to snag a running back and uh, after every team makes their roster cuts now one thing that the Jaguars need to do is they need to clean up on their penalties Yannick Ngakwe the three pump thing stupid but that's easy to fix but, um, you know, one thing that really came into effect this game is the whole lowering your helmet rule, which is a totally bullshit rule. I mean, if you look at the A.J. Boye contact against the guy he was trying to tackle, both of them look like mirror images of each other lowering their heads uh, trying to tackle each other. And, you know, they call it against, like, A.J. Boye. And, you know, these players, they have to, when they come into the league, man, they have to try something where they say, look, you're going to be getting hurt. You know, you're at risk for concussions, you're at risk for CTE, you know, you can't come back and like sue us or anything just because, you know, I mean, if you want to, man, you only have to play in the NFL for three, four years if you invest your money right and uh, you're really all that worried about concussions and whatnot. But these guys are out there playing the sport that they love and uh, I mean, there needs to be, there needs to be something that like goes on with that because this could hurt. This is probably the worst rule I've ever seen established like in the NFL and uh, I, I hate the direction that they're trying to take with that. And one thing that was even worse in the, than the helmet, the lowering your helmet thing was they called like a rough in the passer on what was essentially like a sack. Like it was a sack. Uh, it, they called it, you know, Cody Kessler got sacked and it wasn't anything gruesome or anything. He just went in there and tackled him. They called a rough in the passer. Like what the hell is that shit? I mean... We'll see kind of how these rules go on. Like, I hope they tone it down a little bit. And, you know, I don't know what... This is going to probably affect a lot of games around the NFL. And it's just really, really unfortunate. Now, I do also want to touch on the six wide receiver spot. I mean, none of the top five wide receivers really um, impressed all that much to me. Um, they were just going out there and kind of doing their thing. But um, it was interesting because Jadon Mickens returned most of the punts and he was also out there on kick return. And then bagging him up, D.D. D. Westrick went out there and he actually had a really long punt return before it actually got called back. But Rashad Green had like one punt return and his one punt return wound up probably winning us that game. You know, it took... Uh, he had like a 50 plus yard return taking us to the five yard line before we were able to punch it in with about two minutes left and you know Rashad Green kind of making a case for himself to make the roster you know we'll see how much volume he gets next week you know that might propel him to uh, be able to get like the first look on like different punt returns that they have but you know this next game uh, seeing what they wind up doing at that punt return spot where they wound up playing him uh, that'll be a huge indicator of like really where they feel he stands on the roster. So yeah, that's kind of my reaction to this game. I wouldn't read, like, I don't, you can take take it for what it's worth. I wouldn't read too, too much into preseason games. You know, I'm kind of glad that we went out there and made some mistakes because it gives us something to correct. 
Uh, you know, the preseason, you know, I say this a lot, but uh, preseason games are almost like talking to like a hot girl at a bar that has like a boyfriend, you know, and you know that at the end of the day, you're not going to get lucky. Uh, it's kind of like that just because, you know, preseason, it's it's nice to look at, you know, it's it's fun to like watch and everything, but at the end of the day, um, it doesn't really mean much. It's just like a glorified practice. It shows you what you're good at, what you need to work on, and, uh, you know, what you need to kind of, you know, do going forward. So, you know, take preseason for what it's worth, and, um, you know, this Thursday night we play the Falcons at a home game in like a dress rehearsal type of game, so... You know, really looking forward to that game. Uh, let me know some of your reactions in the comment section. Like the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And this is UCF Jaguar with GenJag.com, and I'm out.